This is Edward Murrah Wingfield's memorial in the latest church at Jamestown, Virginia. But today, Edward Murrah Wingfield's life is being commemorated, as you will see here in England. This portrait of Edward Murrah Wingfield was painted by the well-known artist Alan Barlow in 2002 after he had studied contemporary portraits of Edward Murrah Wingfield's grandfather, his uncle Charles Wingfield by Holbein and two close cousins painted by Pantocha and Jonsson. From the 1580s, many Englishmen were inspired by one man. His descendant, Colonel David Rawley, described this drive to explore and colonise the New World thus. Colonel David Rawley, could you kindly tell us how your ancestor Sir Walter Rawley inspired the early Virginians? I think really that the adventurous spirit was actually the main thing that uh, drove him and others to, to follow on from that. Um, if he hadn't tried to set up the colonies, uh, then it might have been um, more difficult for others to see the possibilities that there were out there. Although his colony failed, um, it did lead to great things, as we've seen with Jamestown. This wall was part of the rebuilding of Kimbolton Castle by Edward Murrah Wingfield's grandfather in the 1520s. This is Patricia Pashley, the only known descendant of Edward Murrah Wingfield's grandfather, arriving, followed by Murrah Wingfield Butler, daughter of Edward Murrah Wingfield VI of Richmond, Virginia. Then come a guard of 12 pikemen and musketeers, part of the Honourable Artillery Company, the oldest regiment in the British Army, and the escort for the Lord Mayor of London on ceremonial occasions. Permitted today, through the signing of a royal warrant by the Lord Mayor of London, to process from Kimbolton Castle to Kimbolton Church, to attend the service and to process back again afterwards. Jeffrey Gilbert, could you tell us about Compton Castle and Raleigh Gilbert? Compton was built around 1320. My ancestor Geoffrey Gilbert came across from Totnes and married the heiress. There was a, an old house there, we don't exactly know what, and they enlarged it and fortified it in um, 1475. And it's been pretty well untouched since then. Um, my father then, the family sold it in 1785 and went to Cornwall. My father, Commander Walter Rawley Gilbert, bought it back as a ruin, effectively, in 1931, and restored it in apple pie order, rebuilt the hall, which was a ruin when I was a child, and handed over to the National Trust in 1951. Great. And we continue to live there. Could you, could you tell us more about Sir Humphrey Gilbert and, and Rawley Gilbert, please? Sir Humphrey fits into the picture of the, of the colonisation because it was his original idea, and basically, the French had been out in America and the Spanish, but Sir Humphrey colonised Newfoundland in 1583. He didn't discover it. Cabot had discovered it 100 years before. Yep. Sadly, he drowned on the way back, but it was England's first overseas possession. Then his brother, or rather half-brother, Sir Walter Raleigh, carried on and organised the colonists for Roanoke Island. Sir Walter Raleigh didn't go there, but he organised it. And Sir Humphrey's son, Raleigh Gilbert, went to Maine and was one of the eight grantees of the Charter, signed 10th of April 1606 by James I. Mm -hmm. And he went with George Popham to Maine 
and set up the colony, built Fort St. George, and they built, which I think is an amazing thing, a ship called the Virginia, in which they eventually sailed back. And that's uh, how it all fitted in. Oh, great. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> Forward march. Standards, in the order they appear, are first, Edward Morrow Wingfield's banner, second, the Free Dutch flag, he fought for them in the 1570s, third, the Union of England and Scotland, 1606, and lastly, St George's Cross of England.
had to remember things past of a family whose place was here in Kimbolton, the Wakefield family. If these walls could talk, I imagine what they would have to say would be both intriguing, perhaps even slanderous at times, sometimes humorous, but always relevant. In Kimbolton we feel that there's a sense in which we encapsulate a microcosm of English history and we're very, very pleased and honoured to add to that sense of occasion to that. A little later on, Bishop John will dedicate and consecrate the Wingfield Memorial. But as you're here, perhaps for the first time, remember this place in your prayers, remember its past history, but remember also its present mission and its purpose in our world today. Welcome to you all once again, and in a very real sense, welcome home.
apostle to the Ephesians, beginning in chapter 3, verse 14. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask of him, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world of Amen. Amen. The word is more.
whom we gather to commemorate on this day. Edward Maria Wingfield set out on a journey which ended in tragedy for him and in much worse tragedy for very many of his fellow travellers. But something greater was enabled to emerge through him and that journey. Now the life of Edward Maria Wingfield was but a pale reflection of his saviour, as is the life of all of us, even the greatest of the saints. But there are powerful resonances operating here. Resonances of journey, resonances of sacrifice, resonances of something good emerging from that sacrifice. I don't think anyone would want to suggest that Wingfield was a saint. It was once observed, rather cynically, that a good working definition of a saint would be someone whose life has not been very well researched. <laughs> well, the life of Edward Maria Wingfield has been painstakingly researched by his descendant, Jocelyn. And Jocelyn has done a very good job at attempting to set the record straight, to recapture the dignity of someone who was maligned during his life and after it ended. And I'd have to say that if any of you at any time ever find yourself slandered and in need of an advocate, yeah. Jocelyn is your man. <laughs> <laughs> he will do the job for you as magnificently as it could be done. Saint Wingfield was not, but remarkable man, he certainly was. He was the only member of the Virginia Company's leaders to be prepared to risk his life to go to Jamestown to see his investment and work with it. Travel to the New World was, of course, a very perilous business, even for the young and fit at that time. And he knew that well, he must have done, before he set out. But he went ahead. He was 56 at the time. Now many of us here would like to think that 56 is very young indeed. <laughs> but in fact, by 17th century standards, it was quite an age. And I would have thought that many of his advisors would have thought it not sensible, to say the least, to travel at that age to the new world. He risked both his life and his worldly wealth in a venture at a stage in his life when he might have been forgiven for taking it just a little easier. He it was who had been one of the four suitors who secured the Virginia Charter from James I. It was a year after the signing of that charter in May 1607 that the first expedition of the Virginia Company arrived at Jamestown and what was to become Jamestown and the sealed instructions from the Virginia Company were opened. From the 13-man council, which they specified, Edward Maria Wingfield was elected president. So, a triumphal entry, in a sense. But there were great hardships to follow. After eight months, only 38 of the 105 men who had arrived at Jamestown were still alive. And just as a few days after greeting him with ecstatic cries of Hosanna to the son of David, the people of Jerusalem turned against Jesus, Wingfield's fellow travellers turned against him and he was deposed as president. <coughs> Rationing of food had led to accusations of abuse and favouritism that he denied. And 
it would seem that there were malign influences at work, as there very often are when groups of human beings find themselves together facing hardship in this fallen world. Proof of the fact that we need a saviour. <coughs> we shall never know the exact truth of the rights and the wrongs of what happened at that time. But it would seem that though he hadn't acted perhaps at all times with the wisdom of Solomon, he became a scapegoat for the difficulties that they were facing. He'd achieved remarkable things after a distinguished military career, ensuring the erection of the vast James Fort, James Fort in just a month and a day, showing great bravery, successfully repulsing an attack from the front by Indians, showing himself, as it was said, a valiant gentleman and sustaining a shot through the beard. It's a final humiliation, though, despite all this, having been deposed as president, he was kept under ship arrest and then sent back to England. Though he surely deserves much credit for risking his life to make the voyage to Jamestown whilst the rest of his peers waited in London, and whilst he can be credited as much as anyone else for the establishment of the colony, he received no credit and was maligned both during his life and, as I've already implied, after it. Perhaps his greatest achievement was to have played a pivotal part in the founding of the first successful English-speaking colony in the New World. And it's even been suggested that without his influence, the United States might have ended up speaking Spanish. Some say it still might, but that's another <laughs> question. The point is that this great man, in terms of bravery and in terms of what he achieved, was one whose life was hardly plain sailing. <laughs>
1550 to 1631, founder and first president at Jamestown, Virginia, where English civilization was first established on American soil. Son of Thomas Mariah Wingfield, MP for Huntingdonshire, and grandson of Sir Richard Wingfield, KG, Knight of the Garden, of Kimbolton Castle. Captain Edward Mariah Wingfield, an experienced soldier, was one of the eight grantees for the Virginia Charter of 1606. Sailing with 105 settlers, he was elected first president of the council in 1607, building the vast James Fort in a month. Still active in the affairs of the Virginia Company when aged 70, he was buried at Kimbolton Castle on 13th April, 1631. I rejoice that my travels and dangers have done somewhat for the behoof of Jerusalem in Virginia. I could not forsake ye enterprise of opening so glorious a kingdom unto ye king. Edward Mariah Wingfield, 1608. Lord God our Father, as we commemorate this your servant, we ask you to bless this memorial, that it may be to all those who see it, an inspiration to draw them closer to his God and ours, in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O oh Lord, in these days when most of the troubles of the world stem from broken or divided families, and when the problems of abandoned children abound, we give thanks that we are able to meet together as the Wingfield family. We thank you that the divisions and separations of past centuries are being bridged and that our family ties are being renewed and strengthened. O oh Lord, may the strength of worldwide family ties continue with our Wingfield cousins and descendants, and may we continue with your blessing to serve you throughout all generations. We pray as our fathers before us, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.
know, O Lord, we have the devil and all the gates of hell against us. But if thou, O Lord, be on our side, we care not who be against us. And seeing by thy motion and work in our hearts, we have left our warm nests at home and put our lives in thy hands, principally to honour thy name and advance the kingdom of thy Son. Lord, give us leave to commit our lives into thy hands. Amen. Christ crucified, draw you to himself to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
Let the officer draw forth. Sam Blackley. I don't know quite what's happening now, but uh, they're all yours. <laughs> Say castle stuff. Castle. Castle. Never had such a key. <laughs> Tomash, descended from Bartholomew Gosnell's Norton Wingfield aunt, the Earl de la Ware, Michael Hyde, descendant of William Wade, the biggest backer of the 1606 expedition, the great historian Professor Harry Ward of the University of Richmond, Virginia, and Dr. Bill 
Kelso, Chief Archaeologist of Jamestown, Virginia. But we got here. I would now like to introduce your host, Mr. Jocelyn Wingfield. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, may I thank you all for being here today. You've come from the United States, mainly Virginia and Texas, from Canada, Tirana, from Ireland, the Netherlands, and all over England. Thank you for coming. Our guests of honor, as you may know, are Dr. Anne Tyler Nettick, Governor of the Jamestown Society, Colonel Jack Jones, who's the tri local tri-base commander, uh, David Rawley, whose ancestor inspired all the early Virginians, and the chief incorporators for the Jamestown Colony. They're all wearing roses, except me. I forgot to put mine on. Lord Summers, Sam Batzel from Arlington, Virginia, um, are the descendants of Sir George Summers. Alan and Mike Popham, descendants of Sir John Popham, Lord Chief Justice of this castle, 1600 to 1607, and George Popham, the nephew who was one of the incorporators. And the kin of the incorporators of the Sajid Hawk Colony, William Hannam, descendant of Thomas Hannam, who married Penny Popham, or Penelope Popham, uh, the daughter of the Lord Chief Justice. And uh, William, could you move up to the rostrum in about five or six uh, minutes, please? Uh, George Gilbert, who unfortunately has had to go, of... Uh, are you still there? Uh, sorry, Geoffrey Gilbert. Right, no wonder. I thought George is gone, but Geoffrey's still here. Uh, of that fantastic castle, um, belonging to Sir Humphrey Gilbert, Compton Castle, down near Plymouth. Uh, Benita and Carmen Benitez, descendants of Bartholomew Gosdell, to my right elbow here. And um, Richard Alicock from Toronto, daughter of uh, Jeremy Alicock, um, 1607 settler with Wingfield and Co. Sandra Bishop, daughter of Rafe Lane, the deputy governor of um, Roanoke in the 1580s. The apologies you've heard, but please add on Annie Charlesworth, daughter of William Wade, the biggest financial backer um, of the 1606 expedition. Catherine Beaumont, I don't know if she's still here, I hope so. She's got to leave, she's in a play, who is the owner of the most beautiful house in England, Otley Hall, the um, ancestral home of the um, uh, Gosnells. Apologies also from Jean Clark, who is the owner of the Wingfields ancestral home, four miles from Otley Hall, the Gosnells place. Um, and some of the old Wingfield House remains, and that was the Wingfield ancestral home from the 1350s to 1708. And welcome especially to Patricia Pashley. Uh, please put your hand up if you're there, Patricia, who is um, the only descendant of um, Sir Richard Wingfield KG of this, um, of this castle here. In 1550, Edward Brown Wingfield was born less than a mile up the hill here in Stonely Priory. And in 1557, at the age of seven, his mother died and he moved to, or she moved before he was 12 to the age, to the to Fotheringhay, which is uh, about uh, a dozen miles over that away, 15 miles. Um, but they kept Stonely Priory up the hill, which unfortunately is on private land um, today. But the owner, of Stanley Priory is here. Welcome, Paul Seabrook. In 1569, Wingfield, at the age of 19, um, went out and joined the St. Ledger um, Sir Humphrey Gilbert colony out in um, Ireland. And for this colony, Jakes Wingfield, who was the, his uncle, master of the ordnance in Ireland, and a very powerful man in the PC, constable of Dublin Castle, the biggest uh, man in his life out of six Marshal Wingfields at the, at the time, who were on all the expeditions and raids on the Spanish and Portuguese. And <coughs> with Jakes, they had to petition the Queen um, to get their colony approved. This, I'm sure, came in quite useful to Edmund Ra later on. So this Munster colony really was a forging house for Virginia. Then he went to Lincoln's Inn, the law school, where next door there are um, celebrations going on today, the next door law school. 
He was then commanded um, a company of 60 foot soldiers fighting alongside the Dutch um, and I'm delighted to welcome Colonel Lambrechts here today representing the Dutch ambassador. Uh, so you see the free Dutch flag would be uh, parade. with Colonel Lambrechts straight ahead there. Now, when Edward Morar in the 15, um, in the 1590s was based in Ireland at Drawder and Dundalk, lo and behold, the person he had to report to administratively for pay and ammunition and that sort of thing was Sir Rafe Lane. And Sir Rafe Lane came from uh, 15 miles over there, um, Horton and Orlingbury, and so was a neighbour, had been a neighbour of his father's and I'm sure they must have yarned away about Virginia. And if Lane told, and, and we've got descendant of Lane here today, I'm delighted to say Sandra Bishop, where are you Sandra Bishop, please put your hand up, right? Uh, in that, there is Sandra Bishop, uh, descendant of Lane, which we only really discovered about two weeks ago, two ancient family trees. Um, if Lane told Wingfield anything, I'm sure the one thing he would have said is, don't settle your settlers more than half a mile or a mile away from the boats. Settle them right next to the boats and that's maybe why Wingfield later on cancelled Archer's Hope and set his own place up, Jamestown. In 1599 came the Essex Revolt and the owner of this castle, known as Ned to Robert Cecil, but Sir Edward Wingfield who was on every expedition and raid under the sun you can think of, was banished as he, was, as he helped um, Essex um, he kept his head, but he didn't keep his castle. He was banished to the Atlantic coast, County Galway in Ireland, for the rest of his life. And um, uh, Alan and uh, Mike Popham here, I'm sure, will understand when I say that um, their ancestor, um, the Lord Chief Justice John Popham, then moved into this castle and took it over for seven years, banishing his wife, who was called Harrington, and I suspect the Harrington, I'm still working on it, but the head of the Harrington clan, who was at Jamestown in 1607, I'm sure the uh, Jamestown Society will be interested in this, um, was connected uh, with that marriage. But the wife and the six children were sent off to the uh, Kimbolton and Stanley Wingfield's London House and London Parish, which was St Andrew's Hoban. And another member of that parish, and they were all tiny, one block in those days, was the second president after Wingfield at Jamestown. It's all wrong in the books. Smith was not first or second president, he was third. Uh, this was uh, Ratcliffe, uh, also known as Sycamore, came from St Andrew's Parish. And John Smith was actually buried 50 yards across the road on the other side of the street in the St Sepulchre's, also full of Wingfields. And the priest uh, in his early years, Reverend Morrow Wingfield, at St Andrew's Hoban, was Richard Bancroft, who la later became or acted from earlier on Archbishop of Canterbury. And so one of the first things later on Wingfield did was to recruit the priest um, from Old Heathfield, Richard Hunt. I'm delighted to see the vicar of Old Heathfield here today. Um, and uh, we'll come back to Old, Old Heathfield and what is shown there. Um, he had to clear him with uh, Bishop Bancroft uh, later on in this little story. Problem um, wanted to get onto the board of the school here. The school was down by Apothecary's Hall next to the church, that area, where um, Dr. Nettick was staying, I believe, right next to there, and didn't move up here until 1953. Um, Edward Morrow Wingfield in 1600 was chief of the Fiofis of the school, i.e. one of the governors, and when Ned Wingfield got banished from his castle here um, uh, to Ireland, um, Popham did not want his man to be on the board and so he tried to get his, his man on and Mara Winkler tried to get another man of his on but I'm sure they settled down as neighbours and started talking about uh, Virginia, settling Virginia because by this stage or a few years afterwards, 1604 the very rich merchants in Bristol roughly and London and the southwest uh, realised they could get a profit from sailing to Virginia from the lands round about. Um, they weren't quite sure how, but it looked a uh, pretty good bet. And they must have been advised by people like Newport and Gosnold. They earmarked, I believe earmarked, as opposed to make them pay for it, 
three little ships, total, ton, 100, total tonnage 160 tonnes, and in those days that would have cost £1,600, which uh, converted by the Bank of England uh, last year um, to dollars would be a quarter of a million dollars. Now, when, you, when merchants set a ship up like that to go off, um, they normally fill it up with marine stores, uh, the uh, defense stores like guns and ammunition, and Wingfield complained there weren't enough of those um, later on, and uh, also the ship's crews. So what um, did the captains need to find? By this stage, they had appointed the two captains, the intrepid Captain Newport, who had presented a couple of alligators to King James, um, which he got, I think, in the Dominican Republic. Um, he'd been on the Spanish Main, he'd made two trips to Virginia, and also uh, Bartholomew Gosnold, who was a double cousin of Wingfield, was appointed as, as deputy to Newport. Newport um, didn't seem to be involved in the planning. According to John Smith, the planning was done by uh, Gosnold um, at this stage. Um, and what was needed was men and uh, victuals. But let's go back one stage. When um, there was a log jam in the preparations for moving to Virginia, um, John Smith says they got hold of Wingfield, Smith and Hunt. Well, there's no record of Smith and Hunt having done anything at all. But uh, the people who came forward to back the operation were friends of Wingfield's, and um, I'm sure he knew uh, William Wade in the Tower of London, and the other big backers um, were uh, the very powerful Sir Thomas Smythe, Martin Senior, Gates, and Oliver Cromwell, who was a cousin of Wingfield as well. Uh, Wade came up with £145, Edinburgh Wingfield £88, that's $15,000 at today's prices. And John Smith, even his biographer, says didn't understand about legalization, but they had to be legalized. and. Um, this had been done before by Edward Murrah's uncle for the colony in Munster, so he did know how to do it. But clearly this charter, as you see over here behind you on the right, there are six or seven copies of the First Virginia Charter. They're all, uh, the text is only about 90% the same. They've all got the same date except that one, which doesn't have the date of the 10th of April. That is my copy, uh, pinned up there, and it's translated for those of you who can't read it, but it's got some wonderful language and I'd like to read about 10 lines of it. License to make habitation and plantation to deduce a colony at any place they shall think, think fit to have and enjoy the gold, silver and copper to the use of the same colonists, not for the individuals themselves. Even though the fundraising was by individuals and everyone else sat on the fence until 1609, it was individuals. But you see there, the gold, Wingfield's instructions, had to be used for the colonists, not everybody. We did give full power and authority to the, to the said Gates, Summers, Hackett and Wingfield that they may take and lead the said voyage and given grant license unto the said Gates, Summers, Hackett, Wingfield to encounter, expulse, repel and resist by sea and land such persons' power and authority to take and surprise persons with their ships found trafficking and they may lawfully, they lawfully may establish a course to be made a coin to pass current there for the more ease of traffic and bargaining. That was signed, as you heard um, in the address, 400 years ago, tomorrow. Recruitment. Wingfield, with his cousin Gosnell, now got down and they recruited 40% about of the 105 settlers. And they came from around here, and some of the names you'll recognize um, as one of the areas they came, like Bedell, for instance, and uh, several that came with the first supply in 1608 and um, uh, Jack, Jeremy Alicock um, from just over there, about 20 miles away. Um, and they also recruited from around Leatheringham and Otley in Suffolk and from London. On December the 19th, and I can make this next bit very brief because you heard it in the address at the moment, so I'll just simplify it. December the 19th, they sailed under Newport with Gosnell as deputy on the way uh, Newport nearly hanged Smith in the Caribbean, supported by Wingfield, because one of the bits I've just read out is that he would um, not command in the voyage, but have a say, um, for concealing a mutiny. 
Smith then went on to write 11 books, or had them ghost written for him by the Reverend Samuel Purchase, and um, in those, basically, he said, I'm a very good chap and nobody else did anything. That's grossly simplified. But his uh, biographer, Philip Barber, Philip Barber was obsessively anti-Wingfield, and the reason given was that he thought he was an aristocrat, and that Smith was a country hick. Not a bit of it, absolutely, totally wrong. No Wingfield was a so-called aristocrat or peer until 1618. Um, I haven't even met Anthony Wingfield representing that branch. Put your hand up, Anthony, please. You are here somewhere, Anthony Wingfield, of the Post Court branch. Right. There were, there were no peers in the Wingfield family till 1618. Uh, see what a minute. Uh, so they got that wrong. He was just a common or garden company commander. And Smith was exactly the same. He had a coat of arms. He had a rich tenant father, farmer. It's wrong in all the books. Lady Bullaby Daresby, I was speaking to last week, and I know her, who owns Grimsthorpe Castle up there, said it's completely wrong. Smith was well off and everything else. He was the same social strata as Wingfield, but there was an age gap. Wingfield was 57, Smith was 27, and all those Pocahontas things are complete nonsense. Ask Samuel Batzel, who, who is here, and he'll tell you all about those uh, Disney myths. There's Sam um, there. I'm not going to ask him to speak yet. On May the 13th, they landed, and Wingfield selected the place as a fine defensive position, which became Jamestown, and uh, built the fort, as you've heard. He imposed strict rationing, during the middle of the worst drought and famine, and um, more nonsense has been written about his not building a defense works to defend the building of the defense works. Have you ever heard such nonsense? All there was, says Smith, was a semicircle of trees waiting to be planted spike end down into the stockade. Well, of course they were. That is exactly what you put up, and it is done in a half moon, and that's what you stand beside, behind when you're building defense works, and it still happens today. You can ask the guys out in Afghanistan. Um, right. He, um, he was then told at this stage by his cousin Bartholomew Gosnell that he was becoming unpopular for, quote, working, warding, and watching the men ever, ever doing that all the time. And, um, of course, these men were work-shy uh, gents who'd never done a day's work in their life, a lot of them. So they were a very difficult lot. But the age gap, I'm sure, came into it. And um, so he was arrested on ludicrous charges. I quote two or three of the charges, and I'm just going to finish off now in about two minutes' time. Um, failing to lend me a penny whistle was one of the charges. Uh, denying me a spoon of soup, denying my son a spoon of rice or whatever it was, such like, and for being a Catholic or an atheist. And his Bible had been stolen before they started, and he cancelled two sermons, and that was put down to his being an atheist, and it was because of Indian attack that he cancelled them. So, to finish off, in 1608, he came back um, he, he had to explain himself. He was brought back by Newport. Newport had him removed from his restraint. And um, Smith, by this time, was also under arrest for the second time, due to be hanged for the second time, when Newport appeared and saved them both. He brought Wingfield back here to answer questions to the Virginia Council. He retired up on the hill, just up there, and wrote his discourse, 1608. And... Um, cleared his name. He was still involved in the Virginia Company, aged um, 70 in 1620. And in 1609, when the second Virginia Charter was produced, there were 700 people wanted shares in that, including, and his name was included in that. So, um, he then died, aged 81. Tremendous age, but not the only one in his family who died as old as that. Um, and was buried, as you've heard, in the church, but um, there was probably only a small funeral as the new kids on the block then were the Montagues, and they were not terribly interested in the old man from up on the hill at Stony having a good funeral, but no doubt people came from Fotheringham.
So to finish off, last three sentences, what did Wingfield achieve? I'd like to give you the definition of founder, straight out of the dictionary. A founder of an institutional organization is defined as the person who sets it up, which he did, legally, causes it to be built, which he did, supervised the building, perhaps providing the necessary money, which he did, he was one of the biggest backers, and one who presides at the erection of a city, already mentioned, and the only one to sail to Jamestown. So he really does truly qualify as founder of Jamestown, even if he did quote plot his copybook later on, and Smith does not qualify. So, Wingfield planted the seed of Jamestown, Smith watered it, and it was Wingfield's cousin, the third Lord Delaware, who made it bloom. And his descendant, the 11th Earl, was sorry to be called abroad uh, today. He rang up a week ago and had to cancel coming. To finish off with thanks, I would like, like to thank all of you of the Kimbolton Historical Society, and of course my Lord Bishop for a lovely service, and the vicar, the Royal British Legion, the PCC, and many, many others. The list would go on and on, really, who have helped with so much today. But a special thanks go to Mr. Richard Brown and the governors of Kimbolton School and to the headmaster for letting us use this historic place for this occasion, for this reception. In gratitude, William Hannam and I, will you come forward, William, please, to the right here. William Hannam and I would like to make a small presentation for your heritage room. Uh, where is Richard Brown? Oh, here. He, he's here. Good. Will, you, will you come forward? On this side. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry. Right. We've got three, three little things we'd like to present to you. The first is that charter there. That's the Virginia Charter of uh, 1606, one of the 67 copies. And um, that's my copy, so because of copyright reasons, I'd like to lend it to you on permanent and then for educational reasons. And that's the translation of on those course captains around the place. Secondly, uh, we would like to present you with a large picture of of Old Heathfield North Isle window. This is the North Isle picture of communion at Jamestown, and you'll find it on the Wingfield website www.wingfield.org, and then church, and then Old Heathfield or Heathfield. It's a beautiful picture, and there is a second one, and a lot more stuff in Old Heathfield Church. And we are delighted to have the picture of Old Heathfield here today. And thirdly, we would like to present you with a picture um, of, I call her Penny Popham, but William Hannam will tell you if it really is. William, would you take the microphone and read out what it says underneath while I hand it to you, it's on the right hand side. Little picture right hand side. Right. Yeah. This is a portrait which hangs in my family's house um, and it's been right for over 400 years now. Um, the inscription underneath the painting does read, Penelope Popham, daughter of Sir John Popham, Lord Chief Justice of Kimbolton Castle, 1600-1607. Circa 1573, she married Thomas Hannam, Sr., and their son, Thomas Hannam, Jr., was with Edward Maria Wingfield of Stoneley and six others an incorporator for the Virginia Charter of 1606. She died circa 1622. And there is the portrait, which you can't probably see very well, but do come and inspect it later. And uh, there we go. Well, Jocelyn, can I just say many thanks for these uh, wonderful gifts. Uh, it's fortuitous that the school, in the last uh, two weeks, has just opened its heritage room, thanks to Nora Butler, and her helpers who have set it up. If you can't find it, I, I, I suggest you head for the gentleman's lavatory and keep going. And if you miss the gentleman's lavatory, you arrive at the heritage room, which is extremely interesting. And I think a lot of work has been put into it. And I'd just like to thank uh, a, a, a former governor of the school, Norman Boys, who provided the money for it. And I'd just like to point out one little thing when thanking the Wingfield family, and I hope they've enjoyed themselves here, that the school, in the preparatory department does have a Wingfield house and that's uh, 
was there, I think as I recall, I was captain of that house when I was here. Anyway, Justin, many thanks. Welcome, uh, Lois Wingfield uh, Wickham. Um, you're from Ashland in, in Virginia. That's right, by 12 miles north of Richmond. Lovely. Everybody's heard of Richmond. <laughs> not many people are heard of Ashland. I guess not. <laughs> oh, well, Henry Clay came from there, but you wouldn't know about Henry Clay. Oh, no, 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 long before me time. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, what we're interested to in know is what's going to be happening at the church in Jamestown next year. Uh, uh, you know, in, well, they're the going to have it open and yep. so people can come through. They have lots of things planned to be there, but they've built a new museum. Okay. And uh, they got, what they had in the old museum, they're moving over into this new one. And also it's gonna have a list of the governors, uh, the early governors of the, uh -huh. the uh, colony. And Edward Morrow Wingfield's name is gonna be at the top of the list. He was the first one, you know. Yep. And it's going to be at the top of the list, and they promised that they're going to put it on the wall opposite the the uh, entrance door. So he's the first thing you see, and say that he's for Wingfield, and Great. have the coat of arms and all that for it. Fantastic. Which is pretty good, because unfortunately they have given a lot of publicity to Captain John Smith. Uh -huh. He, uh, I think Captain John Smith was great at developing. Maps, he the very accurate maps that he made, and exploring and do all that. But he did not build the the fort. Ed, Edward Morrow Wingfield built that, and he tells in his diary, yep. if you've ever seen that, every day how the fort's coming and all. Yep. But somehow along the way, the word slipped around that that was mainly because Captain John Smith said he did. <laughs> he got his history. See, they had to print a report of it when they came back to England. And Captain John Smith got his published, and Edward Morrow Winkfields went to Lambert Hall, oh, yes, yes. and somebody found it in the library there about 20 years later. Ah, oh, okay, that's interesting. And are there any other monuments there, or any new ones? That well, planned? nothing new, not recently. They have a very good monument of Pocahontas uh -huh. as a young girl. They also have one down on the Pamunkey River at the... Uh, Indian reservation, but it sits out on the cornfield so it doesn't get very many vistas. Ah. <laughs> but it's the same thing, and then they have one of Captain John Smith, it's very good, but that's about the only thing they have they've had this time. Okay, great, good. Okay, well, th th that's all we needed to know, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I hope it wasn't too grueling. <laughs> no, I didn't mind that a bit. <laughs> that's fantastic, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You know, women can always talk. <laughs> okay, well, welcome, Great. Alan Popham. Um, Hello, you're you. descended from uh, the family of President George uh, Popham, mm. and uh, we, and who was a nephew of Sir John Popham, who held Kim Bolton Castle from yeah. 1600 to 1607. That's right. Um, the question we'd like to put to you today mm. is: Why did the 1607 to 8 colony at Sag Sagadahoc, Maine, fail? Mm. Well, there were two principal reasons. It was a smallish expedition, fairly inhospitable territory. George Popham himself died in the first winter out there. It's then reported they had a fire in the main storage area. And one of the supply ships which came out to greet them told the uh, deputy, who was Rawley Gilbert, nephew of Sir Walter Raleigh, yep. that his elder brother had died and he was heir to Compton Castle. And I think it took him five seconds to make the decision <laughs> that his best route was to go home and, and leave there. And nobody else wanted to take charge. And I think they were at, at a low state sure. those days. Yeah. And uh, really felt there was no point in, in persevering. Okay. I think, and it is a pretty cold spot in the winter. It's yeah. not, not an attractive place. No. No. So they had a job there. Okay, that's fine, mm. thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll have to leave the other questions then. Yeah, do you think? Well, <clears throat> I really can't. Uh, Douglas Rice is the chap who's Speaking. done okay. the thorough biography okay. Okay. of Sir John. Okay. Uh, I de that, what, what was the first comment about? Did he, said, was he it, involved with the Wingfields? Yes, the truth that Sir John Popham came into Kim, uh, Kim Bolton Castle through saving Sir Edward Wingfield, the owner, from execution, his participation in the Earl of Essex Revolt of 1599. Mm -hmm. 
and exiling him to County Galway. I have no idea. No idea. Okay. No, 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 Whether Douglas fine. Rice has got anything on that, I don't it's know. Right. That's okay. the only possibility. Okay. It's not a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, nice to meet Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> same Bye. here. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, Sam Batsell. Um, you're from Arlington in Virginia, and you're descended from the brother of Sir George uh, Somers, one of the eight incorporators of the Virginia Charter of 1606. We'd like you to comment on the films that have been made about early Virginian life and really to say how historically accurate they are. Well, in the last 15 years or so, there's been three major movies made about Jamestown. The first was the cartoon version by Disney where the first governor, Mike called Ratfield, basically is given over to greed, uh, Indian killing, and a general bad guy. And it goes a little bit beyond what Smith wrote, but the governor is certainly the villain. The second movie made around the same time by a Canadian film company is a live action film. Again, Wingfield's a villain, a very aristocratic fellow who shoots bald eagles before he even gets off the boat, poisons some of the crew, tries to take things over, and Smith, and kidnaps Pocahontas, which is inaccurate. And Smith kills Governor Wingfield in a sword duel, which is very inaccurate. Um, and those two both take the dynamics of Smith's work as a base, and then they need a villain. And since Smith points to a villain, Governor Wingfield, Wingfield's made even more villainous to have that tension you need in the movie, good guy versus bad guy. The most recent film, A New World, by Terrence Malick, is a little different in that it doesn't demonize Wingfield, but it shows him instead as a fellow who is ineffective as a governor and kind of half crazy of starvation and unable to achieve anything, and it has him about to murder Smith, which is also not a good thing. Um, it was denounced, the Mountain River was denounced even by the Powhatan Indians who were hired to be historical advisors. They waited until the movie had been out three weeks because they were paid money, didn't want to ruin its gross. But they said that Malik understood their point that the Pocahontas story, Indian princess saves a uh, captain, English captain from being killed and, and all that was not really true. Um, they had the truth, I thought it was more interesting, but Malik decided allegedly, according to the Indians, not to go with it because he needed the Pocahontas legend, which people know it's very dramatic and he was afraid if he didn't go with it, there would be fewer people at the box office, people wouldn't understand him not using it. And so he followed, as they all do, the Smith, the Smith legend, it's very dramatic. Um, but as the Indians pointed out, the true story is even more dramatic, but so far nobody in Hollywood has been willing to risk the amount of money on, on a motion picture and something that the public wouldn't be familiar with. So Jocelyn, as you know, I'm the executive director of the Jamestown 2007 British Committee. My name is Rebecca Casson, and I wanted to know how the Wingfield family would like to be involved in the British commemorations that are happening in the UK this year and some that are being planned for next year as well. Well, I think the key thing that we, that we wanted to be involved in has been this ceremony today. But secondly, the, uh, one of the most important things to us would be uh, December the 19th. And on that day, our kinsmen sailed away um, to Jamestown, Virginia, where, as you all know, he became the first president. And we would like to be involved with that. And I think there must be a religious content in it. And uh, what we would like to do is to float some wreaths down the Thames, have the Bishop of London and about a dozen priests from the local churches ring the church bells as it goes down the river and as the wreaths float down the river. And as you know, the high tide on that day is either 11.42 or 12.42, so the ceremony will have to be in the afternoon or they'll float upriver. This is a picture of Jocelyn Wingfield the following day, the actual 400th anniversary of the signing of the Charter, where he is signing a modern charter in Cloth Workers Hall, London, um, a copy of which was presented to the Lord Mayor of Plymouth and the Lord Mayor of London. <laughs>